Thank you for joining me today on Side by Side. And for a few days, we're going to think about the Beatitudes. Matthew chapter 5, the first few verses, verses 1 to 12. I've been asked by someone if I would consider them, and I'm only delighted to do so. What a great thing to, to be able to answer the questions our hearts are searching. It begins by Jesus sitting down and teaching the disciples. And it begins by an invitation to them to gather, to listen, because what he's going to say over the course of the next few minutes will be something that could shape the future of the whole of the world if they could see it for what it is. It ultimately will shape the new kingdom, for it will be this that we will, we will pattern our lives after, the very character of Christ. It reminds us of Moses who went up into the mountain and God in that place gave him the law. Jesus goes up on the mountain. He is the new Moses, the greater than Moses, who has come to teach us how we should be and where is the true and blessed life. There have been other occasions in the history of mankind when such great statements statements of human ingenuity have been made, like the 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 the, the manifesto of the Communist Party by Karl Marx, or the Declaration of Independence in 1776, and various other times like this, people have made statements or come out with some sort of a great list of propositions that if, if people would follow these, this will lead them to the better world. Well, we know that if we're to look at um, the communist world, it hasn't been a better world. It has left behind it a trail of millions and millions of people dead and struggling. And if we look to the opposite, the great world of America, which is certainly not communist, it's not a world that is attractive in every way either, but full of problems and struggles of humanity. So what does it look like then to follow the true king, the King Jesus? Well, someone has said that Beatitudes creates within us a sense of the be attitude, the way our hearts should be shaped and that's not a bad way to analyze it, I think. That's a good way. These Beatitudes make up the complete character that we would want to have as God's children. And the first of them, the first of anything, often sets before us the foundation stone, as it were, for everything else. And this one is, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven or of God. Right at the very foundation of everything, the poor in spirit. Let me ask the question, what does it mean to be blessed? The word in Greek is makarios, but the word means more than happy. For if we talk about happiness today, that's quite often dependent upon sets of circumstances being agreeable to us. For example, yesterday, the sun was shining, the sky was blue, it was very pleasant when you were out of the wind, but today is grey and wet, and there is a change in our circumstance. But what about our state of heart? We can be equally content today, as we were yesterday. Now, some for sure uh, who would disagree, and they would much find their life affected by their circumstances, and they're either up or they're down. They're sad or they're happy, depending on those circumstances. But what we're talking about here in these Beatitudes is a sense of joy and contentment that remains unaffected by the circumstances that we find ourselves in. Now, I think there is a progress going on here. I don't think that you get it like a vaccination, you know. It's not just a, something that is injected into you and that's it, finished. I think it's like the Apostle who says, I have learned whatsoever state I am in therewith to be content. I think the spirit of contentment goes hand in hand with the growing awareness of who we are before God and in Jesus Christ. This blessedness is present, for it talks about it being blessed are. It's not blessed 
will be. It's not looking only to the future. It says this is your present condition. But I don't believe that for one minute that you have arrived at the completion of this state. I think that it is a progressive thing. But I think there is a beginning to it, a, com a commencement in it, that then leads on to something else, a growing awareness. So, since this is first, it is, I think, a clue and a key to all the others. And most Bible, most Bible teachers will identify the progressiveness in the link between the Beatitudes. The late Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, in his commentary on Matthew, says that it really means an emptying. And the others are a kind of a fullness. We need to em be emptied before we're filled. And I think this helps us understand we need to have a conviction before we have a conversion. In order that we would be able to begin to respond to the sermon as a whole, that's the wonderful truth that unfolds as Jesus teaches, we really have to come to the point where we realize we cannot do that. We're not able. And reading through the Sermon on the Mount will surely make us aware of how impossible this is. And so that's the healthy point to get to. And this is really about how we understand ourselves. That we see that we have nothing to offer, no good thing. Even our goodness is flawed and tainted and by motives that are tarnished by pride. This is completely at odds with the world, of course, that we inhabit. I mean, there is no question about people wanting to be poor in spirit. Not at all. It's all about self-confidence. It's about independence. It's about our achievements. The present culture is just more in your face with it, but it's always been the same. We can do it alone. We can do it by ourselves. We really don't need God. Well, because we are God. Ask ourselves, where do people have their sense of improvement and, and their, their, their hope of a better future for themselves or for the world as a whole? Oftentimes, if you ask them, it's in starting to work harder, better education, science, medicine, human wisdom, the specialist, the consultant, the banker. But what should I feel when I am face to face both with the challenges of the world around me that are many, but more importantly, when I'm face to face with God? Spiritual poverty is what I should feel. And if we ever lose this sense of spiritual poverty, we will lose our way. Think of the culture of celebrity, even among Christians. It's nothing but a path to problem. Nothing is possible to a person who is unaware of their state of their bankruptcy before God. Let me say that again. Nothing is possible to a person who is unaware of their state of bankruptcy before God. But the opposite is also true, that for the person who is aware that they are spiritually impoverished before God, of course, there opens up for them the possibilities of, of everything that God can do for them. Because this is not to deny the worth we have, we have as we're made in God's image, nor is it to deny the gifts that he has blessed each of us with. But it's about how we then, despite all of these things, understand ourselves as we stand face to face with the, the purity and the holiness of the eternal almighty God. And surely this is not a surprise to us. If, if we have a true understanding of God, it's not a path to self-loathing just, but to self-revelation. I doubt if anyone who is poor in spirit speaks much about it. It shows itself in everything they do nonetheless. They don't, draw attention, they don't draw attention to themselves, even their sense of need. It's more to be expected that they will rather elevate and lift up and make much of the name of God himself than to highlight their own sin. We can employ all of those gifts that God has given us, qualities, strengths, as we uphold God to be good and great. To put it in the way the Bible does, in Isaiah 57, 15, it's, he says there, For thus says the Holy One, who is high and lifted up, who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy, I dwell in the high and holy place, and also with him who is of a lowly and contrite spirit, to revive the spirit of the lowly and the heart of the contrite. We see it in Peter, who says, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man. 
or Paul who says, my boast is only in the cross. It's a complete absence of pride and self-assurance and self-reliance. You can't produce it, but it will become real as we truly see God. Then our reliance will be only God's grace. And because we actively rely there, so many great possibilities will continue to open up. Let's keep looking at God and we will discover both his glory and his grace. For only people who see his glory will want his grace, amazing as it is.